Are we quiet enough? The brain, the mind, the thought. We all share those in common. It is the perception of thought that decides the fate of the mind and the destiny of the brain. Some of us fall under the illness of being mentally incapable, while others try their hardest to silence them. Mental illness has always been a controversial issue here in the United States. Studies have shown that mental illness cases have dated back to the 1700s. Even though we're not certain the direct causes, indirectly brain chemicals are obscured, causing interpretation and perception differences in certain individuals. Indeed, it is something we all have to deal with as a whole, but only few of us want to aid and assist. When mentioning mental illness back in the 17 and 1800s, wealthier families would keep their loved one who's mentally ill because it was simpler, cheaper, and safer. As the cities and society grew larger, people saw the mentally ill as being violent or of the other and not norm just like them. So families decided for a change and to send them to hospitals. America's first hospital to ever care and treat for the mentally ill was the Pennsylvania Hospital in Pennsylvania, Pittsburgh in 1751. The fathers of this hospital are Dr. Thomas Bond and Mr. Benjamin Franklin himself. This was the first hospital in America to care for the sick poor and soon was the nation's first to treat psychological and emotional disorders. Our father of American psychiatry, Mr. Dr. Benjamin Rush, was elected to the medical staff where he believed that mental illness could be treated humanely with better living conditions and recreational therapy during the year 1783. The mentally ill grew larger than the physically impaired people, so a brand new acre was purchased as the Pennsylvania Hospital for the insane January 1st, 1841. Under the management of the infamous Dr. Thomas Story Kirkbride, things were going swell that the Kirkbride plan of the construction, organization, and general arrangements of hospitals for the insane were widely used around the nation. Dr. Kirkbride is also one out of 13 founders of the American Psychiatric Association of October 16, 1844. Today, it is now known as the Kirkbride Center, still located in Pennsylvania. Time passes and there are more and more asylums constructed for the mentally ill. Pretty soon, the mentally ill fell upon inmates in America as well, which puts in an even heavier critical approach on mental illness. Not only do we have those that are mentally ill, but now we have the mentally ill who've committed crimes. Now we have to distinguish between competent and incompetent mental illness. By March of 1841, a brave woman by the name of Dorothy Dix, who's a nurse, a teacher, an activist for the mentally ill, entered the East Cambridge Jail in Massachusetts to see what the conditions were like. Dorothy suffered with mental illness all throughout her life, with herself, her family, and of course with her work being an activist for the mentally ill. Within her visit, Dorothy experienced prostitutes, drunks, criminals, remedials, and as well as the mentally ill all under the same roof being housed together. There was no heat, no furniture, and foul smells, and many wicked therapies. When Dorothy asked why such conditions, she was answered that the insane do not feel heat or cold. Vinny and Zorich, 1982. One of the many wicked therapies that patients had to endure was trephination, which is the drilling of the hole in the skull to relieve the mental illness. It's been proven that trephination has not been effective throughout history of mental illness. Another wicked therapy, of course, is 
insulin coma therapy, which is basically a burst of insulin to a coma to help with the mental illness. This too has not been proven to help with any mental illness in American history. A third wicked therapy would be the electroconvulsive therapy. This therapy is still being used throughout today, so it has been proven to make some substantial changes, but not enough. The fourth and final is lobotomies. Lobotomies is the sticking needle up to the prefrontal lobe of the brain to try to change the way that the brain works in order to cure the mental illness. A famous photographer by the name of Duchesne de Boulogne performed electrophysiology on mental ill patients and photographed them as well. Taking all that she's seen into consideration, Dorothy delivered a memorial to the Massachusetts legislator. Even though during this time women had restrictions on politics, Dorothy made a huge impact on funding and better conditions for the mentally ill. Making her way to all states east of the Mississippi River, Dorothy managed to get 32 funded mental hospitals, 15 schools for the feeble-minded, a school for the blind, as well as training facilities for nurses. In 1948, she sent a final memorial to the United States Congress requesting for 5 million acres be set aside for the mentally ill, granted finally in 1854. The clock struck doomsday when President 14, Franklin Pierce, vetoed Dorothy's last memorial. Even though President Franklin Pierce's own father fell within a mental illness that same year, he still denied it. According to Dr. Graham Wander of Keene State College 2012, Pierce feared that if the federal government assumed responsibility for the care of the indigenous insane, then care for all impoverished Americans would be its responsibility. Which brings me to the artist Edward Keenholz and his artwork named the State Hospital of 1966. The artwork is located in Stockholm, Sweden at the Musik Museum to this very day. This is the exterior of the artwork. It's a grim box-like cell with a locked grimy door that is equipped with a barred window to show the fact of imprisonment more than hospitality. This specific art piece gives an in-depth look on the patient's conditions during the 1940s to 60s in America. The artist Edward began working in a mental hospital in Lake Medicine, Washington in 1947. He too experienced the gruesome by being an orderly. This specific art piece is a mixed media dimension. It is an 8 by 12 by 10. Edward was mainly an installation artist and this installation art stands out the most to me because it speaks the most truth. He too experienced the gruesomeness conditions of bounding, malnutrition, and neglect. Edward wanted to create art that would make people reconsider the throwaway people in modern society. Since mental illness is so controversial but is lightly stepped on, why not try to put forth the light by shining it in art? Famous artist Edward Monk's The Scream of 1893 depicts his battle with mental illness and it shows that other artists cared much about mental illness. Edward completes this artwork with great installation that gives you an actual tactile texture as well as an emphasis on the confinement of the patient. Let's take a closer look and analyze and critically approach the artwork. The patient is locked up, naked, bounded and isolated from the world. The male-like figures represent a man who is mentally ill, his bed is filthy, and his bedpan is with excrements. His head is replaced by a fishbowl with two black fish swimming aimlessly inside. Above him is still himself encircled in a neon figure. All three of these components symbolize isolation and he has no life beyond this room. 
Edward's choice of the bed frame, the urinal, and the barely noticed rolling table to the far left are actual institutional props. The steel white rusted bunk bed that the patient lies on shows that there is no complete comfort within this room within this life. His genitals are exposed and he's very frail. It looks as if there are no clothing, no heat, and no one around to help. Since the patient is bounded to the bed and his urine pan is away from the bed, we can see just how much this man might go to the bathroom right there where he lays. There's no one to help him. They might not even care if he cries out for help. The Marxism of this art piece is that the mentally ill will always be depicted as the other. Even though they are mentally ill, they are still seen as barbaric and violent and in prisoners. The psychoanalysis and cultural studies share the same root. You ever heard of you are what you eat? Well, how about you are what you think? Our social and environmental constructs do play an important role on our mental capabilities. Which is what brings me to my created artwork. Because of these social and environmental constructs, I created an artwork of mental illness bounded by emotions, social, and environmental constructs. Taking a closer look, you can see just how much pain is in the eyes of the beholder. I'm trying my best to not be bounded, but it's overcome me. The black and pink ink just represents that I've tried and have not succeeded past my mental capability.